Okay, hello and welcome to the Pitching Your Idea webinar. My name is Sean Smith and I'll be your facilitator for today. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Queensland Government Department of Science, Information Technology, Innovation and the Arts, and without whom uh, we wouldn't be able to bring this to you today. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. If you do have any questions, we're going to be addressing those at the end of the webinar. You can type them into your console as we're going along, however, and, uh, and we'll get those during the webinar. Now, um, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two presenters for today, Gus Taddeo and Brent Munro. Thanks, Sean. It's Gus Taddeo. I'll start us off on our adventure this afternoon on a, an interesting topic. Brent and I have uh, colluded, and so there's a little bit of overlap between us to uh, emphasise and uh, exaggerate and point out some issues that we think are important for everyone to understand. But I'll start with perhaps a, a controversial comment here. I've heard this mentioned before. It says if you're pitching, then really you're doing it from a powerless position. The implication there that you need something from somewhere else, someone else, and so that uh, may be a perceived weakness. I want to bring it up because I, I don't believe in this. I believe that uh, pitching, if we want to use the American uh, baseball analogy, for every pitcher there's a catcher, and it is the same in this sales process, that someone pitching is looking for the appropriate person or recipient, if I might call them that, where there's a, there's a meeting of needs. Uh, the recipients do need, they want to invest in the right kind of vehicle, the right kind of organisation or individual. And so if the mindset is to have that um, at front of mind, that really it has to be beneficial to both parties, if you enter into that mindset from the onset, then it's, uh, I suppose, raising the likelihood of a successful outcome. So I think having uh, dealt with that elephant, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Now, I thought I'd begin with what I believe is the most difficult of the three options we're going to look at today, which is the elevator pitch. Uh, for those that have not heard the term before, it, uh, it was coined as a bit of an MBA training exercise where theoretically if you entered an elevator in what would be a very tall building in America, because they say you might have up to two minutes, uh, what would you say to a potential uh, investor? So how succinct could you be to deliver the whole message? And so it is essential that not a word is wasted in an elevator pitch. I'd suggest to you that the time frame might be only 30 seconds to two minutes. And if you don't know um, or you can't get the message out in that time, um, today is hopefully a form for understanding what is essential, what is necessary um, for you to be more successful. So if, um, if you want to be concise, there's a few other characteristics that uh, normally increase the likelihood of uh, being favourably received. A big one is the non-tech talk. Um, having come from a medical background myself, I was approached many times by the inventor, quite knowledgeable clinical people, sometimes scientists, and um, they really often did struggle to get the message out in a way that a broad spectrum of people could understand. So, so you may have to consider that the, the lead presenter in an elevator pitch may not be the inventor. It may sound counterintuitive because the, the inventor or developer uh, often has the most passion, but again, it's a, about the meeting of the minds, getting the message across to the right people, to be understood, um, to increase your likelihood of success. So I pose that as a possibility for you to consider. The other aspects, you need to really convey a, um, a confidence um, to make others feel comfortable. I'll, I'll probably deal with this a bit more in another slide. And then um, perhaps the last point was to really anticipate the questions and understand the, the challenges from the other side of the table. And if you're anticipating them and answering those questions before they're asked, that again shows uh, an understanding of what the other party is trying to achieve. We always like to have a take home message in such um, webinars and seminars. So if you had to really distill it down to two essential elements, I propose the following. The discussion is about what problem are you solving? Very specifically, very clearly, and what is that value proposition? So where's the benefit to the listener? We're going to discuss that a couple of times from different angles today, but I pose that as um, really the two things if you focused on had nothing else, if you didn't feel you had the ability or time to do anything else, but then that would be where you are. Well, let's look at um, some concepts of, of value, and uh, I steal from uh, Professor Mark Harvey here. Mark is a uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Southern Queensland in the Research and Innovation area. I did steal with his permission this slide. 
um, because I like the way that it perhaps again showed a pathway of, of, of someone who was in the VC area. Mark was a member of UniQuest, so a commercialisation arm of the university. He worked in venture capital, now he's at academia. So he's got a great broad understanding of what's important to people. And perhaps surprisingly for many of you on board here, make sure that everyone understands management is the starting point. The VC, and this is a model that was applicable to sort of biopharmaceuticals, so quite a complex um, decision pathway, but it always started with management. People are important. You are looking to the management structure to take the idea, the proof of concept, the prototype to the next stage. And so I have found often that people want to jump straight into the product. As you can see in this pathway, they begin with management. They then want to know what the unmet need is in that marketplace. Product follows. And then depending on the complexity of the product, um, maybe consideration of the development pathway, other regulatory hurdles, as that may need the product to be staged to enter that market and hence gain a return. And just to, um, on the other side, emphasise that it's not just in the complex process. I have a stool from Tom McCaskill down the Gold Coast as an angel investor. Um, it has quite angel investors invest first in the entrepreneur, not in the business plan. So again, it's about people. And when I state that and have said that to others, they're perhaps a little surprised. Um, but that's an area that you can directly control. So what do you need to be looking at and perhaps uh, practicing to get your message across? Pitching um, confidence is the key, how you come across. Now Australians perhaps feel a little um, uneasy using the very, uh, may I call it, Americanized version of confidence, a certain brashness perhaps. I don't mean that in any condescending way, but um, it's likely that you will have a heavy representation of people who may come from North America who have been trained in that area from the from the VC or investment community, so be mindful of that. Um, so it is a balance in how you present yourself. Maybe you related to it. It's a bit like the first date. You want to be confident but not seem overly so, so it's a fine balance. Use it how you will. Um, and confidence is important. I had some unfortunately very bad examples running Cook with, again, having people come to us, inventors, who had obviously put a lot of time, passion, money, effort into um, product, a technique, a process, but they came very late. They came late in their um, development pathway and unfortunately portrayed themselves with, with elements of desperation. They were, they were running out of time. They were running out of funds, perhaps. Uh, if there's a message there for everyone, I would say it, it's best to present early. And when you can, it's always easy to knock someone back who's very enthusiastic rather than, uh, rather than be a bit late and find yourself in a, um, a degree of desperation. So next, I would suggest that really you have to prepare yourself, not just the idea for a presentation. How you present um, the pitch, the presentation, will really reflect on what people believe are your personal traits, and they're looking to invest in people. So are you fast, efficient, yet thoughtful, the process, thorough? Those sorts of elements of how you come across in, in the pitch, um, people will regard as who you are, and hence, um, value that or otherwise uh, for their potential investment in what you are. Um, understand the target audience. Brett will address this in a bit of detail, but you do have to fine tune to different audiences and what is important to them. And that value proposition is about what differentiates yourself in the marketplace. Um, if you can't differ differentiate yourself, it's of limited value, I would suggest, as a broad statement. Next, um, writing the pitch down. A lot of us feel like we're, we're super salesmen, so it'll just come off the top of the head. Well, um, I said to you I felt the pitch was perhaps, the elevator pitch was perhaps the hardest of the elements we're going to discuss today. Sometimes you might be prepared for a fantastic 20-minute presentation. Be given the opportunity, you're ready for it, it's all beautiful, the PowerPoint slides are loaded and away you go, and something changes. And I'm, I'm afraid all you've got is five minutes. Condensing down from a large presentation to some of these is a lot harder than expanding it. So write out the scenarios for yourself so you're clear in your mind and keep it nice and simple is, uh, is a big one. What is the problem that your, off your unique offering can solve or improve? Rehearsal um, sounds obvious again, but rehearsal brings, again, confidence and clarity. The best example I've ever heard was, I think it was Kieran Perkins led Sydney Olympics uh, pitch to the IOC 
They did a couple of things very well for that pitch. They replicated the room they had to pitch in and, and created a comfort in their team and in the environment they were going to be working in. And then they rehearsed so much that it appeared spontaneous. And I think that's the nirvana we're trying to achieve. So you appear so relaxed um, that you can almost introduce a bit of levity because you're so well rehearsed. Um, again, not a thing I would suggest many Australians are, are comfortable doing, but you have an objective and we're here to try and perhaps pass on some uh, thoughts and uh, experiences to increase your chances of success. So it's something that I would emphasise is very important. In delivery, you need to practise that of course. I would suggest your car windscreen is your friend. It doesn't talk back. It will listen to you over and over again. Quite literally, if you turn the radio up, people will just think you're singing. You need to speak out loud. You need to hear yourself and go over things over and over. And so it is a commonly used tool, however funny and difficult it may sound. We get in our cars a lot when we drive around. You need to use every opportunity to fine tune your proposal, your ability to, um, to deliver well. Follow up. Um, a pitch to a, to a panel, to an individual, is an opportunity to receive feedback. The feedback will be direct. They are very concise in how they evaluate um, opportunities, but any opportunity for feedback um, is essential and you would follow, a, may I call it a, a routine follow-up process as far as the appropriateness of how long after you pitch um, you might want to hear back from them. So um, seek follow-up actively. So if that was a sort of a, a condensed version of things to consider for um, an elevator pitch, uh, a full pitch is obviously you're able to expand on perhaps all those areas, a bit more about who you are and the you could be your team. Um, you know, again, expanding on the opportunity. What are you seeking, but what do you seek from the other party with a lot more clarity um, over that process? When I say full pitch, we're talking something at least 20 minutes long is what would normally be considered a full pitch. Um, could be longer even given the opportunity, and so you need to be prepared for a variety of scenarios, but a minimum of 20 minutes would be required. So if I broke that down into some areas and just went through, um, for me, the, the bullet points of what, what's important. So yes, who are you and the, and, and the company name? People forget that quite often. Um, what is your position so people understand uh, the person that they're speaking with is appropriate, can speak um, about all elements of the business. They do want to know about your team. I go back to the point before about um, you're looking to invest in people. So the team members you have, and that may be both um, your direct team members, but you should include, if you can, if you have people who act in an advisory capacity, consultant capacity, any of those, then you should include those because the next point is extremely important to the recipients. What is your experience in commercialization? Now, this is not um, an opportunity to try and be, may I call it cute, total disclosure is the default in this area. Um, what you've done, what you haven't done, and in fact, proactively, emphasising what you believe the gaps are in your team because the other party are quite comfortable. They want to know where you are because they probably have the ability to draw in other resources or are used to bringing other parties to the table to complete the team. So it is a total disclosure opportunity here and do not forget to mention the people who have acted in an advisory position to you before or are available to do so to assist you. What does your firm do? This isn't an opportunity in my mind to bring out the org chart and show all the pretty boxes and describe the business units. Really it's just a case of taking another step forward in the understanding. There will be considerable due diligence if you are successful in attracting attention, even in a full presentation. So it's really just the opportunity to, to wrap up in a, few, in a few sentences. I tried to just come up with one in one sentence. You know, we develop and manufacture plastic films for glass windows in extreme climates. I hope that would paint a picture for many as to the sort of sector you're in. It's clarified, develop and manufacture and so it gives, a, it gives enough of an understanding that people are happy to move forward because um, if the elevator pitch was the entree, we're just really at the, at the main course now but there's plenty of dessert still to come if you will. So what problems are you addressing? Now, it's not a list of features. We are talking about the benefits that you believe your process product will provide. Um, people do confuse that with features. It will probably be one of the core fundamental errors I hear in a presentation. So make sure you differentiate. It's the benefit to the user, not what you believe is a feature of the product or service.
that you're offering. Um, having established that, really you want to be telling them why the customer needs the product. And I've put some sort of clarifying points here. What the other parties, the potential investors may be thinking about, what, okay, they might want it, they might need it, but point one, can they delay buying it? You say, well, well they delay if they need it. And I, I use the example myself, it's very attractive to walk into a, a retailer and they might be selling ultra high definition TVs and they look fantastic. They're playing some DVD of the Amazon rainforest and it looks unbelievable. The pixel quality is fantastic. But I am aware that you can't receive a television program in ultra high definition. So you may be limited to a few select DVDs that would have the ability for the television to show in higher quality. And so for myself personally, this is my decision, um, I would delay buying into that technology because I might want to wait a bit longer. It might be at a better cost point. It might be a more useful feature for myself. So you need to convince me why your solution is the most effective. You can sometimes approach a problem from a couple of different directions. So um, convincing the recipient that this is the most uh, effective mechanism for solving the problem is important. And of course, will they buy it at the price you propose and why? So these are questions, they're very important questions. It proves you've done your, a bit of your research or you're in tune with the marketplace and um, the recipient wants to hear that you're aware and, and over these sorts of issues. Who is the customer? What a very basic question to ask. Um, it really does um, astound me that people define you know, the world as the customer. You need a concise answer to this very simplest of questions. Um, and it's a case of, again, being a realist as to who um, essentially would use your product and perhaps if you want to introduce there may be a peripheral group that might be attracted based on some perhaps uh, product enhancements down the track. I have no problem with that. But the recipient wants to know who the customers are and how quickly can we get to them. So is it a product that needs um, some sort of uh, regulatory process, um, so barriers to full um, full rollout in the marketplace because this is an influence on the return that uh, could be expected from that product being released because it may have to be rolled out in, uh, in segments rather than um, in, um, in one hit. What is a competitive advantage? Um, sure, define the way you solve the problem better than any other option, fine. Um, normally this space, there's a lot of discussion on formal IP, fantastic if the, if the opportunity is there or you already have in place um, patents, trademarks, etc., to protect um, your product or process. That's fantastic. I mentioned up there that process IP has a value. Um, the process IP I would define as just a level of, of deep expertise, you know, which is difficult to copy. It could be the way you manufacture something, even though there might be a core element of the product that, that is covered by a patent or some other IP. How you go about manufacturing it, how you go about delivering it may have some, um, some nuances that are not obvious. That, that does have value and, um, and being able to detail that um, is an is a important thing. I would differentiate that from what I would call non-documented knowledge, something you couldn't write down, which is maybe contained in, in that, the head of the inventor and really in my mind that almost has a negative connotation, being kept by an individual not having the ability to um, write it down or have others understand it and utilise it. Uh, I would actually state would be more of a negative than a positive in my mind. So process IP should be considered the unique way you go about doing things. Um, how big is the market? You do need evidence to substantiate this claim. I don't know how many people would come to me, they'd say we have the greatest new tongue depressor as there are 7 billion people in the world, there are 7 million mouths, so the market must be 7 billion. Sorry to use perhaps a farcical example, but um, that sort of extrapolation um, won't, won't do it. The, um, the evidence must be there. You must have done some sort of um, market evaluation. You, do, you may need to do further market testing. This needs to be stated up front. But um, it's all about what could we get to, the time necessary to go to full release, what is the total market um, take up anticipated, but when is important because this influences return. But if you're able to also add other elements, which might be um, other replacements necessary, other upgrades, add-ons, or other things that add another layer of revenue based on the initial rollout, this is a very positive upside to the equation. 
I won't go into this a lot, and Brett would perhaps speak of this, and it seems strange to talk about exit when you're trying to introduce something, but it is essential. The investors are looking for an exit and a certain return on their time and their involvement using their expertise, so you actually need a plan from day one. It needs to have milestones. There should be some estimates on some returns. I won't go any further than that, but it is an essential element of the, of the process that you're starting that you actually have a plan that seems reasonable from the other side of the table as to how you will exit. A couple of slides left. Um, how much investment do you need? I find almost all the time people grossly underestimate. I don't know if it's a, a meek and mild attitude or not wanting to be seen to ask too much, but I would say to you, Asking for too little equates to not understanding the business you want to be in. And that will be poorly perceived by the, um, the VC people on the side of the table. It's common feedback. I've heard it from a variety of pitch forums that um, that's the number one thing they found. People don't ask for enough. They don't actually understand um, what will be required. And that's a bad indicator to the people who are very knowledgeable on what it takes to take um, ideas through to commercialisation. So it is about how much you need when do you need it, but what's it being used for? Um, and the other side of that will be what are you offering the investor for that involvement, uh, and usually their funds. So to summarise, like any essay or anything, when you're summarising um, the presentation, it's what do you want to leave in their head and, and act as a prelude to them asking questions. So pretty standard, what are the problem you're solving? What is your solution? The value you propose, with whom? but how much are you seeking from the other side of the table and what are you offering them in return for that? I thought I'd just touch on the last, it's only a single slide, I've got uh, the sound bite, it's something uh, people may have heard of. Um, it's traditionally associated with, with the media, uh, the politician who has a little uh, sound bite of perhaps a longer um, recording or event. Uh, that can have uh, positive or negative connotations depending on the bent of the uh, editor perhaps as to what they take out and present. But that's where it's most commonly used. From a sales perspective, I've just termed the phrase, it's, it's like your, vis your verbal business card. It's really a case where maybe a, a casual encounter, uh, quite ad hoc, may enable you to make a connection from just the, the comment that you've made and, and encapsulated um, that really should in a, really a couple of words. It's a 10 second window is how I view it. Um, and think of tweaking in this very uh, sort of short attention span world we live in. There's nothing wrong in, in uh, throwing out something that someone might understand and relate to. But what you say and what you develop as your sound bite should relate to what you are as an organisation, as a person, relating to your value and your mission. What's your passion behind it? Is what I would suggest. And um, that's all from me. Thanks, Gus. It's uh, Brent Munro here. Um, I hopefully uh, I'm pleased we're doing a webinar. Both Gus and I have got heads for um, for webinars as opposed to seminars, so uh, um, this should be uh, pretty useful. I'm going to deal with a couple of things uh, um, in the 20 minutes that uh, I'm going to speak. Uh, I'm going to talk to um, you about the uh, value proposition and what affects the value proposition. Um, and uh, secondly, how do you influence stakeholders? And uh, there's a fairly broad definition of stakeholders that I'll talk to you about. Um, from a, a practical point of view, uh, um, this is uh, I'm I'm dealing with this on a uh, on a daily basis. And the examples that I'm I'm actually going to uh, talk to a little bit later in the presentation are in fact uh, real examples that are. Um, probably the last 12 months uh, at an absolute maximum. So uh, um, they're, they're, they're real uh, and they're um, uh, pitching completely different ideas for, to different people. So uh, we'll talk to that. Um, so uh, going the right way, um, I'll um, make sure we... Uh, first of all, um, in terms of the um, value proposition, um, Every idea has some value um, and uh, uh, some commercial value. And uh, um, not unsurprisingly, uh, if you don't get the value um, as the inventor, as the person who actually um, came up with the idea, someone's going to get the value. 
um, um, importantly, um, uh, the uh, um, value has a cost to actually commercialize. Often that cost um, uh, can be f uh, fairly well defined. Um, and the, and ensure, in ensuring you understand the cost of commercialization, production, manufacture, manufac uh, marketing, penetration in the market is an important part of the pitching um, process of, uh, of your idea. Um, so in, in both cases, uh, um, uh, um, really understanding that uh, there is value in the product, the commercial value. Uh, and, I, and I actually uh, sort of come back to Rubik's Cube. I don't know if anyone went on to Google yesterday, but uh, it came up as the 40th anniversary of the uh, idea that uh, Erno Rubik um, invented back in 1974. Um, and there's been over 350 million Rubik cubes sold today, and I suspect more to come given the advertising that it got yesterday. Uh, but uh, uh, funny enough, um, Erno Rubik didn't get a lot of money out of it. In fact, there was another inventor um, that uh, didn't get to a patent um, and got nothing out of the Rubik cube. Erno got about three million dollars out of it, um, and in the 70s or early 80s, that was pretty good dollars. But um, given that there's 350 million of them sold, um, who actually got the money out of it? Um, I would suggest that it wasn't Mr. Ribic. Um, so it's a it's an interesting process of who gets the who gets the dollars. Um, uh, in terms of um, what actually affects market, um, uh, you know, you have to really ask the question um, um, about what market is actually going to be impacted the most? In, in a lot of in a lot of uh, cases, uh, the impact of the market is uh, uh, either positive or negative is going to be your biggest determinant of value. Um, often, uh, um, people uh, in the in the market right at the moment have uh, potentially the most to lose out of the market. So, uh, understanding um, the uh, the loss or, or, or the quantifying the loss that may exist in the market for introduction of the, pro, uh, of the product may uh, include or, or, or certainly um, be a, a pointer towards the value of the product. Um, also, how will those people respond if you actually bring to market an alternative product that's uh, far superior to what's already in the market? Um, we have to understand how people or competitors may respond. And um, <clears throat> you might remember back in the days when um, tapes, videotapes were um, being introduced into uh, the world, um, probably the best um, technical tape was uh, what they call the beta um, tape. And, uh, and the VHS tape was the alternative strategy. And uh, the, the um, beta tape never got into the market very, uh, it didn't penetrate into the market other than in a professional sense, um, mainly because um, the marketing and the uh, market penetration that, uh, and the money spent behind um, uh, the VHS uh, introduction. So that's a reasonable sort of example. Um, the, the, the real assessment process of value comes down to understanding what can be brought to market at the right price that people will actually pay. Um, you know, uh, and, and again, uh, probably a great example of a lot of green products these days um, go to market because they're environmentally friendly, um, but often they're not cheap enough to, uh, to uh, um, uh, impact the market greatly. And until they actually come uh, into a uh, price point where people are, uh, are comparing against alternative uh, um, products in the market, uh, those uh, uh, green products don't actually exist. And, and I see in this in this highly uh, halcyon uh, world right at the moment um, a number of solar companies are going broke um, because uh, of exactly that point. You know, they're they're now. Um, they're, price pointing it at, at a much different price than they did a couple of years ago. And because of that, um, um, their infrastructure is not now sustainable. Now, 
Now, um, an example, a classic example of, uh, and, and this probably goes back to um, um, Gus's point as well, uh, I've got a, a client of mine who's an engineering company and uh, we actually uh, um, uh, went last month over to a, uh, uh, a German manufacturer who's going to uh, be the, the uh, person who's going to most lose or the company that's going to most lose out of the uh, invention being taken to market and we thought to ourselves that they would be the perfect person to take this and run with it. Um, they turn over around $200 million worth of this product at a wholesale value uh, on, a, on a yearly basis and the impact um, of this invention um, suggested that they, um, uh, they were going to in be impacted the most because they are the biggest in the market. Um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, when we got to uh, Germany, um, uh, they wouldn't sign a confidentiality agreement so we actually had a meeting that really skirted around the issue and they uh, didn't invest and didn't do anything because um, they couldn't see the value. And um, So you know, we had a bit of a barrier about understanding you know, whether or not uh, um, putting confidential information on the table um, impacted um, uh, the ability to leverage the value out of the business. Uh, um, as a uh, alternative over the last month and a half, that's proven incorrect and we've been able to sell the product elsewhere. But uh, uh, it was an interesting little exercise where we spent probably $40,000 to get there. And, um, um, and we had a, an hour meeting basically not talking about anything uh, in particular and uh, checking out what the weather was. Um, the same, same engineering company has now met the market in China where they require the same product for 50% less cost. Um, he's redesigned the, uh, the uh, product and is able to actually produce that. And that my question is, have we lost value, have we leveraged value, have we gained value? Um, and, I, and I think in, in, in a lot of ways you, you've got to be fairly dexterous to, to work with that and, and um, make sure you don't lose value and, and be prepared to uh, change your strategy midstream in a lot of cases. Um, one of, the, one of the biggest issues that uh, um, uh, will actually impact on the, on the question of value, on the leverage of value, will be uh, whether or not there's, uh, um, uh, there's barriers to entry that are actually impacting your ability to get to, the, uh, to market. Um, what's the cost of, of penetrating the market? Um, have we got the right initial funding to actually get uh, enough penetration so that we've got some momentum in the market? Um, defining what the commercial in infrastructure is to actually advance, um, uh, in advance to actually um, commercialise the product, including a sales process and, uh, and a, um, uh, um, a methodology, a business model methodology that actually works. And, um, and, and we have to understand that when we're selling something new, um, people aren't necessarily on the same agenda, they just want the see what's in it for them. Um, I, I probably think about the, um, uh, the uh, microwave oven when it was invented. Um, no one knew what a microwave oven was and what the applicability of it was because everyone had um, electric ovens or gas ovens and, uh, and the microwave didn't even have a market but it's now um, a, a must have in, in, uh, in normal um, households. Again, um, just a couple of uh, real life examples and, and both of these are, are very, very current. Um, in terms of uh, barriers, uh, um, um, I've got an accommodation um, client that's got a very, very unique product um, for uh, international students and um, they've actually over the last uh, three years the, um, got 18 different investors to actually put money into this with no real understanding. None of the investors uh, really understood what the ultimate value was. And, um, uh, uh, and my estimate right at the moment is based on their investment and what they've been told, they've probably least lost half of the value right at this moment um, until it becomes uh, totally commercialised. Um, 
you know, I think that's going to stay there for the next couple of years. And similarly, uh, uh, an internet um, company, um, uh, it, nowadays it's a quite a, a sizable internet company, but it, at the time that I got involved in it back in 2007, um, they'd only just started getting um, uh, 15 investors to put up to $11 million into this company. Um, and uh, the infighting that's actually occurred um, over that particular period of time was just extraordinary to the extent that the 80% shareholder was actually kicked out of the company at one stage. Um, and, it, and, it, and it just was beyond uh, understanding how people had a completely different agenda to what his agenda was, um, even though he, he was a relatively good communicator, um, but you know, got the wrong people involved. Um, it's now had a $23 million investment in it. All those other uh, investors are now gone. Um, and, uh, um, but the infighting continues to the extent that there's a number of uh, legal battles still floating around. So um, that's, that's my thoughts on the, the value proposition. Um, the second thing is how to influence particular stakeholders. And I'll revert back to Gus's uh, um, um, uh, discussion uh, a little earlier. Um, and in two words, you've got to pitch you know, to the right people at the right time, but you've also got to pitch the right pitch to the right pitchee. You know, it's no good pitching. Um, uh, and a, you know, a million dollar investment to someone who um, is really only going to put 10 grand into the, uh, into the pot. Um, so uh, uh, in a lot of ways this is around about uh, getting uh, the, uh, um, the right people in the room to actually get the, uh, the um, result that you're wanting. Um, funny thing is stakeholders are fairly wide and I don't actually have them all down here, but I, I, I actually um, have thought to uh, include a couple of ones that probably you don't uh, um, look at every day. But of course the, the, um, the three Fs that are involved, family, friends and fools, um, they, they uh, are the people who are, um, you know, are buying the person who's, uh, who's uh, inventing the product more so than the actual uh, thought of commercialising the product. Um, banks obviously will be involved at a point in time down the track um, if it's ever uh, got any type of bank funding. Um, there's certainly in equity companies, investment companies that will uh, uh, put their hand up as investors of uh, private equity into the, uh, into the business. There's a number of listed companies that will do that. Um, commercial investors, there's business angels that are out there that um, um, will actually put their hand up and, and put money into it. But remembering a lot of these, especially the more professional ones like the investment companies and the commercial in investors will have anything up to 10 to 12 to 15 of these pitches a week coming across their uh, floor. And so there has to be something in it that they're going to actually be really interested in. Um, often uh, people forget about uh, um, who they're working for. Um, if it's connected to the industry that they're dealing with, uh, Apple has a program within their uh, uh, within their um, organisation that allows people to actually demonstrate some sort of um, expertise or, or, or creativity and pitch back into Apple, and they get a, a piece of the uh, development. Um, uh, you know, if it's ever developed, Apple will actually fund all of the development if it's picked. Um, there's only one in 1,000 that is picked in Apple, um, which is a, a fairly small percentage. But uh, uh, the iPod was a, is a classic example of, uh, of someone within Apple actually um, uh, you know, pitching back into their, uh, their employer. Um, often uh, um, you know, industry competitors are, are the pitchees and, uh, again, a, a completely different agenda because they're actually looking at how much is they're going to lose rather than how much they can make. Um, in all of these, it's not the same pitch. The, the people are, uh, are looking at this completely different and you need to make sure, and I, I concur with Gus's uh, um, discussion earlier, uh, you need to make sure that when you're pitching, you're, you're pitching to the right person 
and it's the right pitch for that person. Um, can't get to the next one. Uh, when, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at uh, um, pitching, you have to really look at whether or not you're looking at venture capital. Um, I'm, I'm more specifically looking at uh, pitching for dollars, uh, pitching for funding. Uh, you're looking at venture capital, expansion capital, or some sort of expertise to help develop the, uh, the market, research, the, uh, um, the legalities. There's, uh, there's a lot of people, experts that are, that are floating around um, that uh, will give their time to uh, be a part of the ultimate uh, goal in, the, in terms of the business. Um, in uh, and venture capital, I'll put a, a, a definition of my own up there, it's effectively an embryonic startup capital to develop a prototype and prove the market. And the expansion capital is essentially existing, uh, an existing proven idea that needs funding to expand. Uh, and uh, um, but, you know, people who are, uh, are looking to uh, um, enjoy a, a piece of the stake down the track will actually provide some expertise on the way through. Um, the real issue around the pitch is what's the hook and for whom. So different hooks will actually pro be provided for different people. So for instance, for a bank, if you're pitching to a bank in terms of some debt funding, they're actually looking at what, will they get their money back and what's the alternative securities that are in place rather than the company itself. Um, if it's a venture capital company, um, how likely it is to commercialise the product, uh, how do we get out, how do we get the, um, what do we get for the investment, um, what percentage of the business, what type of return do we get, um, and, and again, is there a way out that's an alternative to, the, to what's being pitched. Um, uh, it, you know, often there's an uh, um, uh, initial s uh, discussion around trade sales or uh, IPOs, uh, initial public offerings that go into the market um, because uh, importantly venture capitalists make their money generally on the way out uh, rather than during the actual process. Expansion capital is a different type of capital raising. It's already a proven idea. It's in the market. It just needs money to actually take it to a new level. And um, uh, um, the, the people who are, pit, uh, who are being pitched to there are looking to whether um, the, the actual industry is still growing, um, what the return on capital is, does the management have the expertise to take the business to a new level, do they need to be sacked and, 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 uh, and you know, put in with a professional uh, management team. Uh, again, they'll look at how do they get out. Uh, in a lot of cases, um, the window is between three and seven years for these people, um, probably an absolute maximum of seven years. Um, and, and, and again, in, in terms of a, if you're pitching to a competitor, um, how, how much do you lose if, we, if they don't invest? So if they, they may even pay a premium to, to sink it. They might see the, the benefit in it and say, that's fantastic, but uh, we're now not going to go ahead with it, but we'll actually buy it in any case. And it, it's, um, it, you, know, you have to sort of consider whether you're in it for the money or you're in it for the, uh, uh, the kudos of getting something to market. Um, I speak around an information memorandum. You may have heard of information memorandum. Um, it's less than a prospectus. A prospectus has a lot more um, uh, um, legal ramifications around the uh, prospectus in terms of its delivery. Um, but in terms of a, a memorandum that uh, is really just providing information to a potential stakeholder, um, it needs to have the right messages in it. Um, get the hook in early is, is really, really important. Don't get too caught up in the technical jargon and the gobbledygook. Um, in, in a lot of cases, uh, and, and I'll go through an example in a moment, um, you know, some of the uh, uh, gobbledygook just uh, fills up a lot of pages and, and um, you know, bores people to be tears. Um, you know, Gus spoke about not telling people about the features but the benefit of the features, and I'm even going one step further and saying don't 
don't uh, tell them what the benefit is necessarily, or to do tell them what the benefit is, but ensure you also tell them what the benefit in the benefit is. Um, so the you know the benefit might be the features might be that it's got four wheels and uh, and drives along the road. The uh, benefit is it'll get you from uh, um, yeah A to B, and the the benefit and the benefit is the the comfort level and the and the kudos and the status that you might get. So it's a it's a it's a, another level of uh, of providing um, information in the uh, in the memorandum. Um, and, it, and obviously the memorandum has also um, already done analysis of market penetration and the cost of getting things to market and, de and developing it into prototypes and those sorts of things. So importantly, uh, um, those uh, need to be supported by proper cash flows and investment analysis. Um, some of the basics uh, that, I, that I see um, aren't necessarily observed in the information memorandums uh, um, all the time is that um, they tend that they can become too complex. Um, it needs to be simple. It, it, you're remembering that some of these people have up to 15 of these a week come across their desk, three a day. So the less complex it is, the more time they've got to, to, to actually consider the project. Um, you need to be authentic and, and pragmatic about it. Don't overvalue the uh, um, the business. Don't uh, you know? Obviously, don't undervalue it. But uh, you know, don't make wildly um, unsupported assumptions in relation to it. And I think um, Gus actually touched on that point as well. Um, always be prepared for cost blowouts. I'll give you an example about that in a moment. Um, back it up down the track with a strategic plan, but never do that too early. Um, you know, I, you know, it's really frustrating to to actually see a strategic plan um, that's uh, um, that's part of an information memorandum when it's um, uh, um, it's way too early to to even consider that you know we've got to actually prove the concept rather than uh, um, develop a uh, um, a, uh, a vision and a, and a core ideology that's uh, just unsupportable. But to also take the guesswork out of uh, what might be needed up front. You know, some of the questions um, that people have got in their mind that needs to be dealt with straight away. Things like governance and, and milestones and, and competitors' reactions and analysis around it and return on equity and those sorts of things need to be dealt with straight away. Um, I've got a, a classic example of an ISP company right at the moment, and it's a, it's got a brilliant hook, um, and I won't uh, I won't go into it, but yeah, you know, the return is expected to be over twenty million dollars over three years, and it's only got a million dollar investment. But the actual information memorandum is so complex that that I couldn't read that in the first draft of the mem memorandum. I had to get it redrafted at least three or four times to take that confusion out of it. And it and it and it gets lost in the mire. The, the hook gets lost in the mire. Um, another simple example is this accommodation company I dealt with uh, a couple of minutes ago, um, expanding into the U.S. It's very successful in Australia. Um, the estimated cost in 2012 to expand in the U.S. was 1.5 million dollars. They've invested one and a 1.25 to date, but they still need another one. $5 million. So uh, that was my point around um, uh, uh, don't underestimate the costs and maybe uh, overestimate them to uh, to actually counter uh, the fact that um, they probably will blow out. Just in summary, and th this is effectively uh, the last page, uh, um, the two things that I've been speaking about is uh, what the effect on the value proposition is. And, and, and probably the point that I need to make out of there is predict the cost benefit and, uh, and know what's going to, going to affect the, the value up front. And secondly, in relation to influencing stakeholders, um, we've got to create the right hook for the right stakeholder and don't expect the same hook to hook everyone. Um, hopefully that gives you some sort of idea of, uh, of the, um, the process around pitching your idea. Um, and uh, um, I'll hand you back to Sean. I think. Thank you, Brent, and thank you, Gus, for those presentations. I think there's a lot of food for thought there. Um, 
and we're going to take questions in a moment, of course. So you can go ahead now and type those questions into your consoles, and we'll uh, we'll address them as they pop up. Um, just quickly before we do, though, um, I'll just let everybody know that we're going to distribute slides from the webinar this afternoon. You'll get that in your inbox. Um, and please fill out our, our feedback form. Let us know what you thought of it. And, and here's your chance to, to suggest some topics for um, future webinars. So tell us what you'd like to hear. Now, I'm, I'm going to kick questions off with a question directed towards yourself, Gus. Um, this comes from Emma. And Emma is asking, how do you protect your IP from the party that you're pitching to? Um, I.e., how do you stop them from taking your pitch and running with it themselves? It's an important aspect, and, um, and rightly so, it does need to be addressed. Quite often depends on the forum that you're pitching in. Um, for example, there might be agent investors that have organised a weekend, a little pitch fest where companies are invited to come along. They may have a pro forma non-disclosure agreement or a two-way confidentiality agreement. Uh, it is essential that protection for both parties exists because remember they're also providing feedback and giving you information and assistance. So it is relevant that it's a document that covers both people's interests. Um, if you don't have access to such a document, I mean AIC here within QMI could easily provide uh, a base document. But uh, the point is uh, it should be requested, it should be adhered to, that some sort of disclosure agreement is necessary. Of course it is relevant to the stage of what you're presenting and, the, and the, the quantum and the detail of what you're presenting. And you may actually need to start off with quite a loose document and then um, involve a document further down the track when you're well advanced down the track that starts to address um, sort of the basis for some sort of commercial return. You do need the right kind of advice. It is a staged approach, so one document doesn't cover all stages of your discussion. But um, a framework of protecting both parties is essential from the outset. So a two-way confidentiality agreement would be my starting point. Okay, thanks, Gus. Can I just speak to that, if uh, if I may? Um, I had a, a, a specific example. Uh, we actually, um, uh, this engineering company that I spoke to uh, about uh, a couple of minutes ago, we sat down with a patent lawyer to talk about exactly that point. These people were uh, that we were pitching to were much, much, much bigger than we were, um, and his advice was even th even though that might cost you twenty thousand dollars to get a worldwide patent, and it might take two years to get eighteen months, uh, between twelve months and uh, and two years. Um, uh, effectively, if they went uh, if, and uh, stole the product, uh, the only way we could actually deal with it was to uh, um, uh, to put a lot of legal fees uh, up front and uh, and and try and um, defend our, uh, our position on the patent. So um, in a lot of ways, it's really very much a cost benefit. Having a proper uh, NDA, uh, non-disclosure agreement, is, uh, is a, an important start to that. Uh, having patents is an important start, but uh, um, you have to also pick your mark as to you know, who's the right person to talk to. Okay, thanks, Brent. Uh, we've got a uh, another question here from uh, Lucas, who's asked, uh, "What fees are involved in using a service to help you to pitch? Any any thoughts or comments on that um, that question at all?" So I'm assuming um, Lucas refers to some sort of external uh, advisor consultant. Um, there's a whole range of, of um, prices available. They're not specialists necessarily lining up in this area because it needs to be someone who's familiar with uh, your field of expertise, etc. So I actually can't off the top of my head think of an individual that, uh, or an organisation that specialises it that, that may be at the level that probably suits uh, most of the people who've been on this webinar. You can go, um, of course, if you go to the, the big four accounting firms, etc., there's a, there's a network of people available, but um, I can't think of a specialist service for SMEs particularly, Brett. <laughs> uh, no, there's not. It, it, generally, your, your advisor, um, um, accountant, uh, and or corporate lawyer um, will assist, um, but not necessarily in relation to the pitch. They'll do they'll do certain aspects around the uh, IM. Um, I think that I think this is you know QMI is probably uh, as good as anywhere to to really uh, hone some of those skills because um, yeah this is all about commercialising product and getting it to market. Um, and uh, um, there are other people. I was a partner of PricewaterhouseCoopers for a number of years, and uh, you know the, the, the SME market, you know the, the actual 
information memorandum prospectuses, those sorts of things for uh, um, for SMEs. Uh, um, there weren't any cut down versions. It was costing similar monies to to anyone else who who went into the market. So um, your best best um, call is to talk to someone like QMI and or your provisional advisors. Okay, um, I've got a, a question here from Michael. Now this might be in your area of expertise, Brett, uh, but but I'll, I'll put it out there to both of you. If the um, pitcher has an account of the direct costs to set up and operate for the first year, how much do you think he should ask for in the pitch? Wow, that's a that's a that's a that's a question that actually is um, uh, probably more involved than uh, maybe Michael actually quite understands. But uh, um, the the monies initially, I, what I can tell you, I did actually have it as a slide um, earlier on that um, if someone comes in really early and puts money into the into the um, business, um, they'll want more of the business than if they come in later after the business has already um, been operating. So um, it depends on the size of the market, it depends on uh, the value it could create down the track. Um, and uh, you know, in, in, the, in the three or four cases that uh, I, uh, I, as examples I, pitch, uh, I um, uh, was talking to before, uh, the amount of money that was uh, being required um, went from a million dollars to a uh, hundred million dollars. So you know, it really does depend on the business um, and how big the market is and how much penetration there could be into the market as to how much you actually ask for in your pitch. Um, it's based on the valuation process. Um, you know, we worked that out at the beginning. We actually create a, a particular value. Um, uh, and sort of work it backwards to say, okay, this is how much we're going to need to actually put this particular uh, idea to market and, and get it to a commercialised product. Um, and uh, you know, we, you know, at the time which it's, it's commercialised, we can actually create and understand what the value is, and then that money, those monies are then going, therefore going to be a, a proportion of those in, uh, those later monies. So um, it's a really wide question. Um, needs a little bit more discussion than that. Um, unfortunately, it probably hasn't really answered that question. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one question that I'll put to the group. Um, I know personally when I'm doing a presentation or a pitch, one thing that I can tend to dread a little bit is the question time, the time that we're in now, in fact, at, at the end of the pitch. Um, you, it's hard to know what's going to be thrown up. So how would, how would both of you suggest that um, you prepare for or being questioned at the end of your pitch, and how do you avoid choking in, at that point? Uh, well, as I mentioned, uh, rehearsal and uh, anticipation are, are key elements to to anything. So, um, you there's your side of the story. You always want to project yourself uh, in a positive, yet defendable light, and, and that has to be done. That's essential. But as I started from slide one myself, it is about it's a two-way partnership, and you do need to consider from the other side. And so. There are elements in any business. They they range from the idea, all the elements we touched on there, and so you need to be objective enough, and that may require um, some external advisors or some people who perhaps know and trust you, or you trust them, but aren't intimate with uh, your business, and so they're quite prepared to ask the hard questions. Is, is providing some feedback to you and asking the um, the worst the worst possible question in each of those categories, and you being prepared for it. You probably know that question deep down. You don't want someone to ask it. To you, um, but you have to be prepared for it. So you go through as many scenarios as you can, and through um, rehearsal, there is the the. Uh, I suppose you're increasing the likelihood should there be a question that you've never even heard of, it may actually be a blend of a couple of issues come together. And so likewise, you can uh, touch on those areas that you're very familiar with, very comfortable with, to come up with the appropriate answer. Because again, I emphasise this has to be a genuine process. This is the beginning of what you hope will be a long relationship. You heard Brett speak of people, um, you would imagine wise people investing large amounts of money and yet a lot of infighting um, going on and, and culture is too broad an, uh, an issue to talk about today but uh, it is difficult. So honestly and openness uh, up front is essential to the process and so trusted advisors who will ask the hard questions that perhaps you already know but aren't prepared to ask of yourself would be my uh, first answer on that. Thanks Gus.
Uh, we've come up against time now, so I think I'll close questions. Um, thank you again to everybody out there who's attended this webinar. Um, we're going to be announcing topics for um, the continuation of this series of webinar in the coming months, so stay tuned. Um, if you're not already uh, signed up to our events database to receive updates, I'm going to be sending around the link for that, so sign up to that. Um, and we hope to see you again shortly uh, for the continuation of our webinar series. And finally, just a, another quick thank you to our sponsors, um, the Queensland Department of Science, Information Technology, Innovation and the Arts. Thank you everyone for attending.